Hi, this is Dave Katzka. Thanks for listening. I'm a gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic um, in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm here to talk about our study entitled The Variations in Presentation of Esophageal Involvement in Lichen Planus. And this is a study that I authored with uh, other members of the Division of Gastroenterology and Pathology, specifically Tom Smirk, Allison Bruce, Ivan Amaro, Jeff Alexander, and Joe Murray. So the first question, of course, is why did we undertake this study? And I think we undertook this study because several of us in the division felt that we'd seen a couple of patients with lichen planus of the esophagus. And it made us wonder, number one, how rare this is, because up until this time, really this disease had been uh, reported only in occasional case series, mostly in single and double case reports. And more importantly, then, was this something we were under-recognizing, perhaps, um, and uh, because of its rarity. We were also concerned as to whether this presents in a classic presentation. In other words, uh, is this an isolated proximal esophageal stricture, as we tend to think of with lichen planus, and particularly with skin diseases that involve the esophagus in general, or was there a much more varied pre presentation, particularly if we can gather a number of cases of this disease? So with this in mind, we went back and reviewed the pathology data uh, for any patient who had a diagnosis of lichen planus or at least a lichenoid type reaction on esophageal biopsy, looking back to biopsies from 2000 and then gathering all cases that we could um, here at the Mayo Clinic. And surprisingly, as opposed to the largest series in the literature, which was six patients reported two decades ago, we were able to identify 27 patients with lichen planus of the esophagus. And we found some very interesting findings as regards to this patient population. First, as we know, lichen planus is predominant in women and consistent with that of the 27 patients, 25 patients were women. But I think the interesting aspects of this disease were characterizing its distribution and particularly its association or really lack of association with extraesophageal manifestations. So in that regard, the first surprising finding was the fact that almost 50% of patients with lichen planus of the esophagus presented with esophageal involvement without any known extraesophageal involvement. In other words, these patients just presented with an esophageal stricture. So that was interesting because obviously we assumed that these patients would most likely have a long-standing history of disease. The second interesting aspect was the distribution as far as what sites were involved and how long had they been, been involved before we made a diagnosis of lichen planus of the esophagus. And specifically, we saw that patients with lichen planus involved in the esophagus most likely had other mucous membranes involved, particularly oral involvement, which was by far and away most common, and then genital involvement, particularly in women. There were a few patients who had skin involvement and nail involvement, but this seemed to be much less common compared to oral or genital mucous membrane involvement. What was also interesting is that for patients who had lichen planus of the esophagus, the time of presentation was extremely variable in the sense that diseases both in and outside the esophagus could present simultaneously. But even more so, patients could have a 20-year history of lichen planus involving the oral or genital areas and then present with esophageal involvement later on, which to me was fascinating as to why patients would have such a long course without the esophagus being involved. Of course, we don't know if microscopically it might have been involved. At least symptomatically, this is still a very long duration uh, between the onset of esophageal disease and the onset of the disease in general. We then looked at um, how long patients were treated before a diagnosis of lichen planus was made. And as you can imagine, because this is an under-recognized disease, it was considerable in the sense that patients could go up to 20 years with dysphagia and stricture formation before this diagnosis was made. More concerningly is the fact that patients underwent numerous procedures, particularly dilations, and this is problematic because we know that dilation in patients with esophageal lichen planus can make things worse, not better, in the sense that these patients will get mucosal sloughing and more, more esophageal damage. And on average, these patients underwent about two to three dilations before having a diagnosis made, and in some cases, up to 15 dilation sessions before a diagnosis of esophageal lichen planus was confirmed. So this was dramatic. 
as you can imagine. Also, these patients were generally treated for reflux over the years, and in fact, one patient underwent a fundoplication with the idea that this was um, reflux disease. Um, as regards treatment, this is one of the difficult parts of lichen planus in the sense that we really don't know which treatments are effective. As you can imagine, there have been no controlled trials, so the host of treatments used for lichen planus, ranging from dilation, intralesional steroids, uh, oral steroids such as, flucon, such as uh, fluticasone or budesonide, to systemic treatments such as mycophenolate, mofetil, methotrexate have all been used, but quite frankly, we, we don't know which ones work. So what can we, can, and then finally, it was also interesting to note that when we looked at these strictures, the distribution was variable. You could find distal strictures, proximal strictures, strictures in multiple places, and in few patients, they actually had small caliber esophagus, that is, a stricture of the entire esophagus, which we more typically see with reflux or now he is in aphilic esophagitis. So what can we conclude from this study? I think several things. First is that esophageal lichen planus is probably more common than we realize and something to consider, particularly in a middle-aged or older woman. Two is that the esophagus may be the initial presenta presenting site of lichen planus and you cannot wait for oral muc other mucous membrane nail involvement before you make the diagnosis. Three is that the diagnosis is important to be made on a histologic basis, but in, sometimes, in some cases the histology is variable, and this is really a diagnosis made in some cases by putting together a compatible history, uh, x-ray, endoscopic findings, demographic findings, with a biopsy which is consistent, although not necessarily diagnostic. So, you know, again, will you see lichen planus on a daily basis? Of course not, but I think it's probably more common than you think, and something you should consider more commonly in your practice. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening.